here. This is the third time I've been here talking about books of mine. Um, and uh, I never really expected I'd write books, but here I am. So I'm happy you could be with me tonight. And uh, the title of my book, as you know, is Enlightenment is an Accident. Ancient Wisdom and Practices to Make You Accident. And the book is in, is in three parts, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about each part and read a, a couple of excerpts from it. Actually, I won't open the book. I've got the expert excerpts here in my notes. Um, so, people have been telling me that's a catchy title. Um, I don't know where it came from. I think it was my idea, but I still don't know where it came from. Shabala decided to put a, um, a spilt milk <laughs> bottle on the, on the cover, which is pretty, pretty interesting, I think, pretty interesting. Um, so, enlightenment is an accident. Uh, well, for those of you who know about spiritual traditions, the Eastern spiritual traditions, can you hear me okay? Oh, well, they can't. Let's see, can you turn this up a little bit? <laughs> Just a little closer. Oh, I have to. I can just go closer to it. I can turn it. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. You don't have to turn it off. I just have to be closer. I can position a little bit better, so you don't feel. Oh. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, an accident. Well, uh, this is this is key that when we when we develop a meditative practice when we go. On a, on a spiritual path, especially in an Eastern spirituality, the goal is enlightenment. And everybody wants to know, what is that? And what does it entail? And how do I get there? Um, and of course, it only happens by accident. It only happens when, when we completely get out of the way. When we completely die to all of our worries and concerns. And even to the, to the R, to the worries and to the concerns and die to the, even to the idea of dying because I can remember being a young student and I wanted to die. <laughs> I thought that was the real way to do it, to die. <laughs> so my wanting to die prevented me from having this wonderful accident. Um, so, we, but we, we, so we can't do it, but we can make ourselves accident prone and that's what we do, those of us who are in serious spiritual practice of some type. type. And I have three sections in my book. One is the settling in phase. Uh, now, uh, uh, that's the phrase, well, I'll, I'll talk about that phase in a little bit. The second one is the hard work phase, which I call stumbling toward enlightenment. Not so much fun, necessarily. Um, uh, practice gets kind of old. You know, meditation sort of gets boring. Now, any of you who have been, been with this very much know what I'm talking about. But if we stay with it, we made the commitment, uh, uh, then the third phase is falling away. We completely let go of everything, including trying to let go. And we just enjoy living. <laughs> we just enjoy living. Moment to moment, day by day, <coughs> week by week. Regardless of what happens in the external world, of course, things don't always go our way, but internally, we, we feel a wonderful connection. And that's a key, key teaching in, in Buddhism, the inner being of all life. And with that inner connection, we're, we're saved already, because that's our salvation, is that everything is inner being. And always has been, whether we, whether we realize it or not. So I'm going to talk first about the settling in phase a little bit. Finding a teacher is pretty important, or a mentor. It doesn't have to be a teacher. A mentor, someone who's been there, done that, and has really steeped themselves in it so that they can, they can guide us. And I talk in my book about uh, two of my earliest teachers. Maybe I talk about three of my earliest teachers, uh, Kadiguri Roshi, Suzuki Roshi and a guy named Tolan, uh, a Chinese teacher that I spent 
quite a bit of time with in San Francisco and haven't talked that much about. Uh, and finding a community, finding a community. And the community doesn't have to be a formal Zen community or a formal Buddhist community. You have to have kindred spirits to do this with, or you, or you fall away, or you, you, know, you give up, or you um, just get discouraged. Some kind of community. And the best teachers I talk about in the book help us see through all the images that we're projecting. We want to be, we want to look good. I want to look good in front of you. Is my hair combed? <laughs> uh, do I do I show my age? I wouldn't want to show my age. <laughs> so we hide behind these images because we're always trying to portray ourselves in a good light. Uh, and those images prevent us from just being intimate with what is, just being available to what is, just enjoying what is. Uh, so, seeing through the limitations of self-image and persona, Basho the high poet, year after year a monkey's face wears a monkey's mask, I say in the book. <laughs> That's Basho. Uh, and we wear that mask, those different masks, because we're scared. We're scared and we want to get along in the world. So, but those masks present us from just enjoying this inner being of everything and everyone. And, and uh, uh, instead, we want to try to follow one of these one of these old timers' advice, like Wei Nung, who says, "If you reflect on your true face beyond image, you find the secret." So we do have all these images, and uh, they come from our childhood, they come from our adolescence, they, and, that we carry around. And, uh, but we are able to divest themselves, ourselves from them through a deep spiritual practice. And I've talked, those of you who heard me talk at Zen Center over the years, I've talked a lot about my gifted child status. And that sounds wonderful, but it was so hard on me I was trying to live up to this image that I almost, that I, 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 I thought I was going to kill myself in the eighth grade because I couldn't be the gifted child I was supposed to be. And uh, I think I talk about that, well I talk about that in one of my books, and if not in this book. Uh, so because we get so fixated on being what we think we should be, or might, it, might be, or could be, that we just don't relax into just being. So uh, uh, a good teacher helps us uh, both walk the path and uh, uh, practice being with the dots. Uh, myriad dots make up a path, and we're always trying to get somewhere. So we're on a path, even if it's not a spiritual path. Anyway, we want to get somewhere. But dot practice means that we're just here where we are, being with this, whatever it is, and that propels us on the path. So my uh, first teacher, Suzuki Roshi, said, find your inmost request. Stay with your inmost request. Stay with your aspiration. Move on the path toward your aspiration, but don't do stepladder zen. <laughs> my first teacher railed against stepladder zen. <laughs> oh, I'm here, and then I'm going to get there. He's already here. Eric's already up there. I'm just way down here. <laughs> oh, well, luckily Gary's below me. <laughs> yeah, my goodness, what we, what, what a number we do on ourselves and other people. Oh. So, uh, uh, but we do need aspiration, and we have an opportunity to appreciate each experience as a wonderful opening on this path. Without where we. We move from there to here instead of here to there. Uh, and I, I talk in this book, and I think in one of my other books, about being with my teacher in San Francisco when I was going to go to Japan. And I was going to practice uh, at just the right monastery where they didn't have all this extra falderal, all this ritual and serving guests and stuff like that. You just did meditated, meditated, meditated. That's what I wanted. And uh, 
uh, I was looking around, searching, trying to find the right one. I was having breakfast with him one morning, and he pointed to the Raku pottery on the shelf next to him. Uh, raise your hand if you know what Raku pottery is. Um, uh, most of you do. Well, Raku pottery is Japanese Zen pottery in which they bake in the flaws. They bake in the cracks. They bake in the, the mistakes. Um, as, as, so each each piece of pottery, and, and he had pottery cups, is, is unique and alive because it's authentic. It's not, I'm not trying to be anything more than what it is already. <laughs> and that's what we appreciate about it. It's just baked in. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I must have been saying something to him over breakfast. I can't remember about, about what I was, my comparisons um, and what I was going to do. And he said, he pointed to the to the shelf and he said, if you try to find the best cup, you will not appreciate any of them. Huh, huh. So we're always trying to get the best this, the best that. Uh, and yeah, each cup, each cup is the best in a way. It is because it's alive. It has all life is flowing through it. <clears throat> so then I didn't go to Japan after all. I stayed with him. <laughs> So in this practice, one of the things we have to be practice, we have to be uh, careful about, especially in the settling in phase, is spiritual bypassing. Uh, bypassing our broken places. We don't want to admit them. We don't want people to see them. Bypassing our vulnerable places. But those are places where we are accident prone. Those can be openings. Those can be openings. So in the book I say, uh, talking about vidya, deep seeing from Sanskrit. Uh, many spiritual aspirants completely ignore the darker elements, the fear body, which buries these negative emotions deep inside of us, the shadow self, repressed ideas, instincts, impulses, weaknesses, <coughs> desires, perversions, traumatic memories, embarrassing fears, and a myriad of large and small humil humiliations, whatever we don't want to admit to having. So we do that. It's, it's natural that we do that, but uh, 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 we have a chance to open up to those and to not, not uh, make a commitment to feeling our suffering, to feeling our pain, whatever come, whatever comes up. And in deep seeing practice, we, we see it, we re relax into it, and it releases. It releases. <clears throat> So part two, now that we've now that we've settled in to the uh, commitment, we've made the commitment, is uh, stumbling toward enlightenment, <laughs> or uh, the hard work phase. Stumbling toward enlightenment sounds a little more romantic. The hard work phase, of, uh, <laughs> but they're the same. We stumble. It's hard work stumbling. We, we we if we really engage, we never do it right. We're not ever doing it perfectly. There are always flaws, there are always cracks. And um, so it's, it's stumbling. And I talk about five tools that, that we can use as spiritual practitioners. I talk about hindrances as portals, using the Buddhist five hindrances. I talk about bringing the aggregates into view using the Buddhist uh, outline of the five aggregates. I talk about mantras, galas, Gatas and malas, that's the third uh, tool I talk about, the third portal I talk about. Uh, the fourth one is seated meditation, and the fifth one is immersion in nature. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. So in Buddhism, we have the five hindrances, craving and greed, restlessness and worry, lethargy and boredom, doubt, aversion, anger, and hatred. So, uh, in this practice of vijja, v in Sanskrit, vi, vision, vijja, clear seeing, deep seeing, we look closely at the hindrance. We notice the, the emotion that's connected. I'm greedy, for instance, because I feel inadequate, but feel, because I feel lonely, because I feel cut off. We notice what sensations, what thoughts come up and we trace it towards its root, not judgmentally, but just kind
kindly and openly and, and it falls away, it falls away. Until another one comes up and then we're stumbling again. <laughs> so I call this uh, 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 portals, these are portals, these are openings. We want to get away from them, we don't want to have the craving and greed, we don't want to have the aversion and anger and the hatred, they are portals. So the second uh, uh, chapter that I have on bringing into doing these practices to stumble toward enlightenment is bringing the aggregates into view. So the five aggregates in Buddhism are, uh, so Buddha said supposedly there is no, there is no real self, no abiding self. There are only five aggregates, form, content, sensation, feeling, perception, impulse, and consciousness. Uh, so in early Buddhism, the first 400 years they, they had a practice of bringing the aggregates into view uh, uh, because the fifth aggregate consciousness wants to take over the whole thing and the first four, four are just a me, about immediate experience so the first aggregate is I put my hands on this desk uh, uh, this, this podium uh, it feels smooth it feels smooth it anchors me it anchors me. So that's the first one. I, I have contact. I have contact with this form, which is the podium. The second one is uh, I have a feeling of warmth. I have a feeling of, oh, I like this. Oh, this is good. <laughs> and then the third one is perception. I have a perception of, oh, ha hands, on, hands on desk, hands on desk. And then the fourth one is I have an uh, an impulse to get rid of my papers and just put my hands on the desk. It feels so good. And then consciousness starts chattering about it. Consciousness starts saying, well, why can't you just keep your hands on your papers? You're supposed to be keeping your hands on your papers. You've got to pay attention to your notes. And why do they have such a nice podium? And why have I done such a poor job at Zen Center taking care of my own desk? Boy, I could have done a, a, a job half as good as they did, but no, no, no. I'm so sloppy, I just have to, consciousness goes over and over and over, so we miss being here, we miss being here. So bringing the aggregates into view is just coming back to contact, to initial feeling, to perception, to impulse, and that's still consciousness, but not letting consciousness bully the whole process. Consciousness becomes the big bully, Vijnana in Sanskrit becomes the big Bully, the, bullies the whole thing, so we miss just being alive. We can't do dot practice if we get stuck on that. <laughs> so that those are the uh, those are the five aggregates, and in that same chapter, I talk about how, as we do the practice with the aggregates or a similar practice, it doesn't have to be that practice. We begin to shed our skins, uh, skins of protection, the layers of protection that the mind uses. Uh, because it feels uh, like it needs to chatter and worry and complain and be upset. And those are skins, and they're skins that harden. And uh, there's a, f a famous uh, Buddhist teacher called Nagarjuna, who is the serpent hero. And uh, Buddha supposedly was protected by a serpent during his last days before enlightenment. And the serpent hero is the, is the hero who learns how to shed his skins. And as he sheds his skins, of, or his, their skins, or her skins, of, of worry, of concern, of anticipation, of regret, uh, we feel more sensitive. We don't need that many skins. But we don't want to peel them away too fast. I want to have an enlightenment, I'm going to peel those skins off. Oh, we're raw. But through this practice of what, bringing the aggregates into view or any of these other practices, the skins begin to fall away. And we begin to just be sensitized to life as it is, to each other as we are, and ourselves as we are. Flaws and all, cracks and all. The cracks are the openings. The cracks are the openings. 
so I say in my book, continually shedding those old conditioned ideas passed down from generation to generation. <clears throat> Each time we shed a skin, even though we're taking a risk, we feel more alive. Shedding beliefs and memories that have given us comfort and security in a time of confusion or loss. So that's the second practice. The third practice I talk about uh, <clears throat> is uh, use of mantras, gatas, and malas. And uh, mantra is something you repeat to yourself, uh, and many, many different types, many different traditions, and you can find your own. Gatas, which are similar, but they're uh, situationally related. They're related to specific situations. We used to have a gatas around Zen Center in the, in the early days. We had probably one in the bathroom, one in the kitchen, uh, one in the, uh, oh, there's still one there. I, I saw the other day that out of all that we had for those years, there's still one next to the mirror in the basement, and it's about shaving. <laughs> so now when I, something like, now when I shave myself with all beings, I, ju I just enjoy the feeling of shedding my extra whiskers, or something like that. I'm just making so gathas, gathas and mantras help us come back when we wander off, when consciousness just takes over the whole scene so much that we miss just being alive. Um, and malas, malas are those prayer beads, uh, uh, which uh, are not that different from the rosary in the Catholic Church. Although unfortunately, my grandmother's rosary, rosary was always punitively related. She would have to do so many Hail Marys if she was bad, and if she was really bad, she did more. So, but, but malas, and I really think the Hail Marys are to help us come back to just being alive where we are, and not, not off in some daydreaming or, or hyper-anxious state. So gatas, malas, and mantras I talk about, I have a whole chapter on them, and the uh, uh, first mantra I was given was by my, my first teacher, and I was having a really hard time in a retreat, and I was being flooded by uh, discouragement, discouragement. If, if you sit in a long retreat, you probably at some point will get flooded by discouragement. And uh, uh, I was so flooded that uh, I, was, I was perspiring a whole bunch. Of course, it was summer, too. <laughs> I was, and he said to me, when I went into one-to-one -one with him, probably the fifth day of the retreat, he said to me, you have been swimming in the ocean. And he said, now go change your shirt. <laughs> Pretty practical, right? And he said, and then come back. So I went and changed my shirt and came back. And he said, you're having a really hard time, aren't you? And I said, yes, yes, yes. He said, well, repeat this mantra, which is gone, gone, gone beyond. So I repeated that for the last two days of the retreat. And, oh, all of all of my all of my anxiety just fell away. It just fell away. Um, and then when I had Lyme's disease, uh, many years later here in in Minneapolis, um, I would uh, I would stay in bed all day, uh, and then go downstairs for my meals, which my wife very kindly prepared for me, <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't really meditate except sitting in bed a little, but, but many days I drove to the lake, I haven't even told Linda this, I drove to the lake, and uh, I didn't walk to the lake, it was only three blocks, but I was too tired, too exhausted for my Lyme's disease, I would, and I would sit, I would look at the lake, and if it was calm, then I began repeating a gata that I made up, and uh, um, <clears throat> I want to I want to <laughs> I want to find the gata because I haven't repeated it in a long time. <laughs> Looking at Lake Calhoun, seeing my still nature in its reflection, heart mind at peace, and I repeated that with my breathing, and I stayed every day at the lake for maybe a half hour. And then I and then I shortened the gata to 
Looking, seeing reflection, peace. Looking, seeing reflection, peace. So God says, oh, wonderful tools that we can use. And malas are just, give us a chance to tactically uh, use the tool of a mantra or kata. So we could, with each bead, as we move each bead, we, re we recite it. When I was in Bhutan, uh, I said, all the monks and nuns had these, had these malas, 108 beads strung around. And they were always, they were, they were always mumbling to themselves. <laughs> and they were mumbling to themselves their mantra or their gata. Oh, very beautiful. And, and it seemed, uh, it's, it, 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 it quieted people down just to have them around there <laughs> doing that, that wonderful mumbling. So that's uh, the third practice that I talk about. The first practice that I talk about is meditation. I'm not going to talk much about that because most of you know a lot about meditation. But I talk about focused meditation, using your breath or using a mantra or a gatra. Um, and that's one of the two key Buddhist types of meditation. I also talk about girl awareness meditation which is more commonly called mindfulness meditation, where instead of focusing on something narrow, we just open up to whatever's going on. And then I talk about uh, relaxing into don't know mind, which is a Zen term. Uh, uh, this is what Katagiri Roshi used to call do stupid zaza, he would say. Do stupid zaza. That means you just, you just do it, you don't try to you don't try to do bare awareness, you don't try to focus, you just sit. You just sit and, and let the let the movie let the movie do its thing. If it wants to repeat the same scene over and over again, you just watch the same scene over and over again. <clears throat> so those are the three types I talk about in that chapter. Then I have a chap final chapter in this section on immersion in nature. Very, very important part of the Zen tradition, the Chan tradition. Not much part of uh, uh, Indian Buddhism, not there. China, Japan, and now the U.S. Immersion in nature. John Muir uh, was um, uh, an important person to me when I was a kid. Raise your hand if you know who John Muir is. Oh, yes, many of you do. <laughs> well, John Muir charted all of the trails uh, in the Sierra. Uh, maybe in the 20s or the 30s, and, and wrote about them. And he was he was a mystic too, and I think he did some in the Rockies. But we, <coughs> growing up in California, we only spent time in the Sierras, but we did that every summer. And here's John Muir, I quote in the book, between any two pine trees, there is a door leading to a new way of life. Between any two pine trees, between any two uh, willows, between any two birds, between any two sparrows, There's, they're pointing us to a new way of life where we feel connected, where we feel joined, where we're not caught by tomorrow and yesterday, or even the next hour and the last hour. They, they show us, nature shows us, shows us how to do vidya, how to do clear, deep, open, loving seeing. <coughs> Chan's story. A monk asked, where do I enter the path? In the ninth century, teacher said, do you hear the sound of the stream? The monk said, yes, enter there. Enter the, the sound of the stream. Divine wildness called it. It's what D.T. Suzuki called it. Connected to, not separate from. Connected to, not separate from. Dogen says, to fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the mountains. To fully enter the mountains is to fully enter the swamps. We want, we want to bypass the swamps, don't we? We all want to bypass the swamps. But if we fully enter the swamps, the mountains are there supporting us. If we fully enter them, of course. Of course they are. There are mountains hidden in mountains. There are mountains hidden in swamps. We don't think there's a mountain there, but if we just take care of it and just are with it and open up to it, right in the middle of that swamp, So uh, we call this, we in, in our tradition, letting go of the map. And 
and uh, I have a story in the book about that, but I don't, I wonder how we're doing time-wise. Does anybody? We still got a good. What time it is? 7.35. 7.35. Oh, okay, well, I'll tell this story then. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, it's in the book, it might be in two of my books. Uh, uh, so, uh, everybody's still wondering about enlightenment, probably. Many people are. Get this. Where's the enlightenment? Where did you get to the enlightenment? Well, I'm going to tell you about my nine-year-old enlightenment. <laughs> so when I was nine years old, I went every every summer into the Sierras with my parents with my John Muir book, with hit my dad's John Muir book, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, uh, the the book had the had the trails very carefully marked, very carefully marked. So we were going to climb, when I was nine years old, my father announced that we were going to climb a 14,000 foot peak in California named Mount Langley. And, uh, and he said, you can do it, Tim. And I thought, oh, okay, whatever you say, I'll do it. Uh, and then he said, and you can carry the little John Muir book. So I did, I carried the little, and we set off before dawn. And I carried the little John Muir book, and I like it because I could look at the mileage could see how many miles do I still have to go as a quarter mile to this resting point or a, a mile and three quarters to a stream really helped me. I had my map. Uh, and we'd gone on for quite a few hours and kept going up, 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 up and finally got to Timberline. I don't think I'd ever seen Timberline before where there's nothing and where the map just stops. It just stops. At least it did then. I'm sure it doesn't now. I'm sure all. I'm sure Timberline is all mapped out now. Just stopped, and uh, and I didn't want to keep going without my map. We we're so attached to our, our our ideas that we don't want to keep going if we don't have our map, if we don't have our habit formation supporting us. So, but my mother and father encouraged me. My mother more. My father was way ahead. <laughs> my mother just encouraged me, kept encouraged me to, to keep going one step at a time, she had, uh, and I did, I did, but it was bizarre, all the rocks, no trees, no plants even, it was scary, barren, scary, nothing, talk about emptiness in Buddhism, nothing, nada, nada, so, uh, but I remember crying and sitting down on a rock, and my mother just came and sat down by me and didn't say anything, um, but I could tell that I, didn't, I was that, that, that I was expected to go, and that I didn't want to go back by myself. I'm only nine years old, so I had no choice. So I did. It was difficult, uh, but at some point I just let go, and and just began noticing the rocks and the different formations and the sky and the Birds. And by the, and then the first thing I knew, we were at the top, because you know when we let go and release, and we're just involved, we're just available, we move beyond the limitations of time, whether we're nine years old or eighty years old, we do. We move beyond the limitations of time. And so uh, then we were at the top, and my mother said, <coughs> "Oh, <coughs> you should sign the book. I bet you're the only nine-year-old." who's ever made this, and then she wanted to look through the book, and I just laughed. I mean, I was having such a wonderful time with the sky and the rocks that I just laughed. I didn't laugh at her, I just laughed beyond her. And, um, so that's my nine-year-old experience. <laughs> so, we always have these opportunities to have this accident. We always do, always. Uh, so then I talk about, uh, I'll summarize that part, and I go on to my next part, which I'm going to talk much less about, uh, and that's uh, falling into wakefulness. So uh, uh, falling into wakefulness means we be, our neuron constellation begins to soften. Our neurons have gotten hard as we get older and older, but our neuron begin to soften, 
uh, and, we do, and we settle into a, a natural neuroplasticity. I've got this on my mind because I just, I'm teaching Buddhism and brain science right now at Sensei. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> we hold with kindness and curiosity even our private parts. We just don't do. And I say, each rejected aspect within our shadow carries within it the seed of wisdom. Is waiting to show us something important about ourselves. But this feels quite perilous, as it requires us to see things we don't want to see, accept the unacceptable, and embrace the deplorable. The wisdom of the shadow is about manifesting wholeness and balance, what Dogen calls whole being Buddha nature. So when we do this, we're beginning to fall away. We stop pushing. We stop Pushing. The more we push, the more our neurons harden. We released, and we may be on the verge of having an accident. We may be on the verge. Our mind begins to give up, boundaries dissolve, and as Dogen says, the separation of body and mind fall away. He says body and mind fall away, but, uh, but it's really the dichotomy. The mind is always trying to control the body. Body's doing its thing. The mind's doing its thing. How they, how can they come together? How can the, uh, but that dichotomy just falls away. Either or thinking falls away. All or never thinking falls away. During the pandemic, so many people had depression, and depression is, is I can, it's never going to get better. It's hopeless. I can never do this. The government is never going to straighten it. This is never. I'm all or never thinking. Anytime you're caught in in uh, all or never thinking, that's remember that you're overlooking the inner being, the inner communion that's always going on. And all or never thinking is really hardening our brain cells. <laughs> so we notice that we just laugh at ourselves, and we we move back to just being here. So we collapse even the dichotomy between suffering and joy. And this isn't intellectual, it just happens. Separation between us, all of us being softens. I mean, it's more of an opening rather, an inner being rather than a rigid boundaries. I call this in the book, but I'm not going to talk about it, dancing, dancing with Nagarjuna's tetralemma. Serpent Heroes Chapter 1. Some of you have done this work with me in the past. So, um, uh, this means being patient with our impatience. This means being generous to our stinginess. This means whatever we're caught on, opening up to the other side. Opening up to the other side. That's what my teacher, my first teacher called Big Mind. What Thich Nhat Hanh calls inner being. And what Dogen taught calls taking the backward step. Because we have to take a backward step. The forward step is trying to get somewhere. The backward step is just, just opening up to something beyond limited consciousness, to, to big consciousness. <clears throat> so we're no longer glued to the foreground. I'm no longer glued to how oh, well am I doing? Did I do okay? Instead, I, I pay attention to that, but I'm not glued to it. If I do awful, so I do awful. <laughs> you know? After all, I'm getting to be older, so I'm going to be doing awful more and more, probably. <laughs> it's kind of inevitable at my age, don't you think, Eric? <laughs> no, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, no, we're no longer glued to the foreground. Uh, then the accident's already happened. Uh, we feel supported by all life, and we support all life. And there's a wonderful spaciousness. Wonderful spaciousness. So that's the uh, quick summary of my book. And I'll be glad to... What time is it, Barbara? Yeah, quite a few. Oh, I, you know, according to our host, I have a little time to do questions, answers remarks by anybody.
thirty and old. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's old and there's young. And old and young are, are always interpenetrating. So you're old, you are very old, as I am. You're either older than me, much, much older than me, but you're also very young because you're part of this wonderful neuro neural neuro neurologically plastic world and consciousness. <laughs> But you are old. You will, be, you will be leaving your body sooner than many of these people, as I will. Oh, well, that would be interesting. We leave our bodies, won't it? Yeah. The next experiment. Pardon? The next experiment. The next experiment, right. right. Anything else? Anything else? Yes, I David. I know you you didn't want to talk as much about the third yeah. third session, but um, I'm just curious if you could say um, what happens along the way. Can you speak? Because of your mask, it's just a little hard for me to hear you. Okay. If you could just say a little bit, what, what is life like after you've fallen away? Your well, it's the same as before, and it's also very different. Very different in that mm, we feel just okay with whatever. We just feel okay because we're not caught by the movie. Usually we're caught by the movie. I, I talk about this in one of my books at least. We're caught by the movie that's going through our minds. But even if, even if it's a scary movie, it's not our movie. It's not our movie. So whatever happens, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. On the other hand, it's the same, exactly the same, <laughs> because it's ordinary life. It's just putting on my glasses and deciding whether to wear a mask and, and shuffling my notes and making sure they're organized. <laughs> and on the other hand, it's completely different because there's a sense of this, um, peace inside, but not inside, just peace. And not even peace with a label, because as soon as it Peace, that's a label, and that hardens the neuro neurological uh, configuration. It's a peace beyond the peace we understand. But then we think, oh, we got to get that. It's beyond because it's right here. <laughs> but at the same time, it's completely ordinary. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming tonight, and um, I'll be uh, uh, counting my money out there, <laughs> although the money doesn't go to me, it goes to other folks. You know, this is capitalism, right? <laughs> I don't get any of it. I'll be counting it anyway. <laughs> I'm just teasing, don't feel obliged to do anything. <laughs> and you may have already looked at the book plenty, or just listening to me maybe plenty. So uh, I'm going to stick around here for two or three minutes, and I'm going out there. And uh, uh, we'll do I'll signing and then. A place for me to sign. Yep, we'll do signing and so you can just books. line up and chat. Oh, so I'm yeah. sorry, what did you say? You can just line up, or people can line up and chat and get the book signed. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but anyway. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.